Okay, so chapter two now is where we are going to really start to look at how the immune system works. And chapters two and three are going to be dedicated to that innate immune system. Let's recall what those levels of the immune system are though. I can get this slide to advance like I, there we go. So um, when we ended chapter one, we talked about how there's this outer barrier. Then we had the innate immune system, which then moved into the adaptive and then finally memory. Well, we're gonna break that down just a little bit further with that innate immunity. And we're going to look at how there's this first line innate immune response, but then there's actually going to be some mechanisms of innate immunity that come into play that um, are, are going to have some effector functions um, before we actually move into the adaptive immune system. But what's important to keep in mind is that once the innate immune system starts or is kicked off, it's going to continue even after other subsequent steps start. So the innate immune system is just going to be the very first thing that happens, but it continues throughout um, an organism's battle against a pathogen. So when we think about a response to an infection. Anytime that our bodies come into contact with a microorganism, especially um, uh, if it's a pathogenic microorganism, uh, there's going to be some sort of prevention that the body has to just keep it out in general, right? So we don't want to have to fight an infection if we don't have to. So the bodies are going to spend a lot of effort or have a lot of um, components in place to prevent microorganisms from getting in in the first place. And so that's that very first line of defense even before infection can start. Um, and it's going to be that outer barrier, the skin, the, the oily glands that have acids in them, um, our saliva, our lysozyme and our eyes, all of those things, right? But if a pathogen is able to get beyond that first line of defense, then there are some mechanisms that come into play that are not going to be specific. They're going to be very generalized against any type of pathogen. And those are brought into play. And that is that first line of innate immune system. Then there's going to be a second layer of innate immunity. Again, it's nonspecific. It's going to be for any type of pathogen that gets in. Maybe it can differentiate between a bacteria and a um, a parasitic worm or something like that, but pretty much is going to be standard across any type of pathogen. And the second set, this is where gene expression is going to change in a certain subset of cells uh, based on that the expression of these different genes, these proteins will be made that those genes code for. And with any luck, and if all things go as planned, the innate immune system can pretty much take care of a pathogen within a couple of days, right? So this innate immune system kicks off real quick within a few hours of infection. And hopefully within a couple of days, this pathogen is completely eliminated and you don't even know that you were infected. Or maybe you had some inflammation, some redness, some swelling, maybe a little bit of pain, but nothing that would cause you to seek medical treatment or anything like that. That is a good function functioning innate immune system that is able to clear a pathogen. If for whatever reason, the innate immune system is unsuccessful and is overrun, that's when adaptive immune system can kick in. But even once the adaptive immune system is going, there are still mechanisms of the innate immune system that are carrying on through. So all, all things just to, to know that they're going to work uh, in concert at the same time with each other. So those physical barriers, that first line, let's take a dig into this just a little bit deeper. So we have the skin. The skin is a huge organ, the largest organ of the body, and it's outer, there's many layers of it, right? And that outer layer is made up of squamous epithelial cells that are kind of overlapping each other like shingles. And um, that's going to prevent any pathogens from getting through those overlapping layers. Now, if we take a look at the internal tube, right? So we have the esophagus, we have the, the GI tract, um, those and the respiratory tract, those are not lined by squamous epithelial cells, but rather by either columnar epithelial cells or cuboidal epithelial cells. But nonetheless, they're going to be epithelial cells, that's the outer lining, and they're going to be spot welded or have tight junctions. 
uh, together to prevent any passage of pathogens between those cells. So pretty much, oh, and then also all of the, the mucosal associated uh, lymphoid or mucosal associated um, linings are going to be covered, or mucosa, I should say, mucosa are going to be uh, <clears throat> covered in mucus. And that mucus is going to contain antimicrobial peptides and, and different um, chemicals that make an inhospitable environment to kill pathogens and uh, maybe trap them and expel them before they can get inside of the body. So there's a lot of different mechanisms just in barriers that the body has alone. Again, we have a microbiota. So this would be more like a biological barrier rather than a physical barrier that we saw with the skin. And when we talk about a biological barrier, we're talking about um, other microorganisms that take up the space. So on our skin, yeah, we have epithelial cells that are overlapped that prevent pathogens from getting through, but it's also covered by a whole bunch of staph and other types of bacteria that are just like, hey, no, this is our land. Get out of here. We, we, we found this. We're staying here. This is our home. You don't, there's no room for you. And, um, and so there, it's called competition, right? So you have this competitive um, biological barrier that will prevent pathogens from even being able to take a residence. The issue here, though, and this is also like in the gut too. We, you know, you know that our microbiota is very, very robust inside of the gut. And further and further you get down in the enter, um, enteral system, you get more and more bacteria. By the time you hit the colon, that's pretty much all bacteria. Um, and and we call this, you know, good bacteria or our microbiota. But if for some reason that good bacteria is wiped out, say you take an antibiotic. Uh, for an unrelated infection, you can wipe out the good microbiota, which then opens up space for pathogenic bacteria or other opportunistic pathogens to get a foothold. Uh, our microbiota have a symbiotic relationship with us. We provide a nice safe home. Um, with food for these organisms, they provide us with, you know, some nutrition so they can break down food in our gut that we don't have the enzymes for. And we're able to get some nutrition out of things that we normally wouldn't. Um, and so they can help with our metabolism. And overall, a good microbiome has been associated with overall good health. So that's nothing new. You can read all about how a healthy microbiome can lead to a healthy life um, pretty much anywhere. It's, it's, it's a pretty common um, uh, bit of knowledge now. So here's a diagram from your text. Uh, I don't know if my picture is blocking some of it, but you can go ahead and you can look at the slides in Blackboard. Um, but we have our chemical, mechanical, and microbiological or biological um, uh, external barriers, right? So our mechanical is going to be those tight junctions between the epithelial cells, the overlapping of the epithelial cells, just preventing pathogens from getting through. Um, our respiratory system has cilia, that, that ciliar, ciliary elevator, kind of a hard word to say, but that is constantly sweeping up and any pathogens or gunk that we might inhale gets caught in the mucus, the cilia are flapping upwards, and then you just cough up, you know, you hack up a big loogie and spit it out and it's gone. Um, our nasal secretions, our tears, our saliva, those are all going to be mechanical um, as well because we're going to be moving um, pathogens out of our body. Chemical, along with those um, along with the, the mechanical things that we have in the respiratory tract and the eyes, we also have um, chemicals in those solutions. So we'll have antimicrobial peptides, enzymes that break apart pathogens. Maybe it's the outer membrane that's breaking down. Maybe it's the cell wall that is breaking down depending on which antimicrobial enzyme we're looking at. Uh, fatty acids are going to create low pHs. Um, in different areas that are inhospitable to pathogens. Um, and then we have a whole bunch of antimicrobial peptides as well that can insert themselves and bust up membranes, bust up, um, usually bust up membranes, but we'll look at those in a little more depth um, in a few slides. 
One thing that we need to spend some time on though is differentiating between an intracellular pathogen and an extracellular pathogen. This is a very important concept when we talk about the human immune system. And it's something that we're going to go back to pretty much in every chapter, in every topic that we talk about in immunology, we are looking, okay, is our body dealing with intracellular pathogen or dealing with an extracellular pathogen? Because the mechanisms that the body will utilize are different based on where the pathogen is located. So an extracellular pathogen is considered to be a pathogen that replicates and can live outside of a cell, okay? So here is our, our cell, right? This is the extracellular space out here. And if we have bacteria that are living and replicating outside of the cell, that's considered an extracellular pathogen. But let's say that a cell creates a um, phagosome, like a, a phagolysosome, you know, opens up, does some um, endocytosis and engulfs this bacteria and brings it into a vesicle. That's still considered an extracellular pathogen because it's in the extracellular system. <clears throat> so they can be inside of a vesicle, inside of either that's a phagolysosome or um, a phagosome. So sometimes, um, you know, fungi can be brought in, but we see bacteria get into vesicles. But anyway, if it's, if the pathogen can live outside of the cell or live inside of a vesicle, that is considered an extracellular pathogen. Um, parasites are big extracellular pathogen. Fungi can be, um, are most notably known as extracellular pathogens. And for the most part, bacteria are too. There are some instances where bacteria are not going to be able to survive outside of the cell. Now this is different than an intracellular pathogen. So an intracellular pathogen is going to be any pathogen that lives and replicates in the cytoplasm, so somewhere inside of the cell. And that means they're going to be in the cytosol. So in this case, we have viruses that are inside the cytoplasm and that is the only place that they are able to be viable and replicate. And so those would be considered intracellular pathogens. Now you can see these bacteria these um, fungus, I think that's a fungi, right? From our previous slide. Um, and this is a parasite. They look like they're inside of this drawing, but they're inside of a vesicle. So these are still considered extracellular. Now, there are some bacteria that can replicate inside of the vesicle. They're still considered extracellular bacteria. Um, to a point. Once they become, sometimes they can get out and start to replicate inside of the cytoplasm and then they would be considered intracellular. So it is very important for you to be able to differentiate between an intracellular pathogen and an extracellular pathogen. Generally speaking, viruses are intracellular, bacteria, fungus, and parasites are extracellular. Generally speaking, of course, there are exceptions. Some of those latter ones can be an intracellular pathogen, but viruses are never going to be an extracellular pathogen because viruses must be inside of a living cell to replicate. Okay, so that's a key concept um, that we'll use throughout the semester. Okay. Some other mechanisms that the innate immune system um, kind of works along with, or rather these other systems work along with the innate immune system, uh, would be the coagulation system. 
Now you're probably like, coagulation doesn't involve the immune system, but no, they can work together because what do we know about when there is a coagulation event? Once that cascade starts and all of those proteins start coming in and forming a clot, that clot becomes very solid and rigid and it can actually trap microorganisms inside of those fibers. Um, and then the microorganisms are trapped. They're not going to escape out into the rest of the body. But then also platelets, those silly little things, you're like, a platelet doesn't do anything. It's just a fragment of a megakaryocyte. or of a megakaryocyte. But actually, they are able to release prostaglandins and some other enzymes that are able to um, break down pathogens and, and help with the antimicrobial defense. So cool. Uh, they also then help with wound healing and repair of tissue that um, gets damaged during like a you you fall off your rollerblades and you scrape your knee, right? Uh, your bacteria from the sidewalk get in and um, the coag, the clot can trap it. And then the other enzymes can start to kill those bacteria. So pretty cool that the coag system um, kind of works along with the immune system. Same with the kinin system. So um, kinin is going, there's a set of um, uh, enzymes that are going to be able to uh, help with vasodilation um, and release of muscle. So smooth muscles can relax. And then that allows for um, the pathogens to be moved out and damage of the tissue repaired. So not considered part of the immune system, but they can work in concert anytime there is damage to the body. It's pretty great that these enzymes kind of all just work together to not only clear and eliminate pathogen, but then to wound heal to prevent further pathogens from getting in. Okay. Now I used the term antimicrobial peptide a few times and didn't really go into depth on what those are. Well, there's a bunch of them. And we know that peptides are proteins, and these proteins are have the function of being antimicrobial. So that's where the name comes from. And so they are soluble in, they're just floating around in the bloodstream all over the place. And when they come into contact with a pathogen, they can actually have an effector function that can destroy the integrity of that pathogen. Um, defensins are a big group of these antimicrobial peptides. And there's alpha defensins and there's beta defensins. And they're just groups. But largely what they're going to do is they are hydrophobic, hydrophilic. And so they will, uh, or they're, they're, um, they'll insert themselves into the hydrophobic area of the lipid bilayer because they're charged. So here is a list of different defensins that we, you know, know quite a bit about. There's many, many more. If you go online, you look up a list of defensins, you'll see that there's many more, many more each, you know, every so often because research is actively being done in this space. But um, you can see that they're um, alpha, mostly on this table and the one beta uh, defense in there. They're enzymes pretty much, um, but they some of them do form pores and you can see uh, kind of what, um, what biological effect they have. So um, anyway, this is all information that you can research as you need. If you're like, okay, I need to know about an alpha defense in, you know, or a beta one defense in, you know, like what does it do? You can take and you can and look that up, but it's pretty, um, pretty cool that these defenses are able to not only kill bacteria, but in some of these actually neutralize uh, any enzymes or toxins that are produced by bacteria. Again, pretty nonspecific, um, and that's why they're included in the innate immune system. Okay, with that, I'm going to stop here because the next um, section is a doozy.